Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for joining us for our iSchool Spring Lecture. We are very excited to have you here from Dr. Shirag Shah and Dr. Tanu Mitra. As the world changes around us, the iSchool is continuing to move forward to create new generations of information leaders. Our goal over the next decade is to find ways to leverage information in ways that improve our local and global, global communities. We are committed to conducting and supporting impactful research. Dr. Shah and Dr. Mitra are part of a research group that will focus on researching accountability, trustworthiness, building and evaluating of AI systems, particularly taking a human-centered perspective. I'd like to take a moment to share a little bit about our two presenters this evening. Dr. Shah is an associate professor here at the iSchool and his specializations focus on information retrieval and information seeking, data science, and personalization and recommendation. He is a founding director of the Info Seeking Lab, which focuses on issues related to information seeking, human computer interaction, and social media. Dr. Mitra is an assistant professor here at the iSchool, and her specializations focus on social computing, computer supported co cooperative work, and online misinformation. Her work employs a range of interdisciplinary methods from the fields of human computer interaction, data mining, machine learning, and natural language processing. We hope you enjoy this lecture and will gain a deeper understanding of algorithm bias and governance. As this academic year comes to a close, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today and continuing to be part of our iSchool and UW community. We look forward to having you join us for future events. Tanu and Chirag, take it away. Thank you so much, Dima, and um, hi, everyone. I'm very happy to uh, be invited here to talk to you today about um, algorithmic bias and governance. Uh, with me is Tanu Mitra, uh, and we're going to take kind of turns um, going over this talk. So this is a topic that's very near and dear to us, uh, but there's a reason for uh, going into this. Um, as we look around our world, on one hand, we see uh, there is a ton of information. You know, we're living in this information age. We have this information school. Um, but it only helps us, it only goes so far as our ability to get to the right information at the right time. And because of the way our systems work, because of the way we work, we've started finding kind of loopholes in this landscape. So I'm going to start with some examples. Where is this bias loophole? Where is this kind of uh, problem? Um, we'll go into then why is there a problem? And then I'll uh, introduce some work that we are doing in this space. So we're not only just reporting this work um, of problems, but also um, sharing with you some of our efforts uh, in this space. So let's start with uh, some examples of where we see this bias. So here's an example of searching for CEO uh, in your image search. Now, of course, you're probably going to see slightly different results. And now, uh, since this kind of thing has been around for a while, Chances are Google and others have done more to fix it, but this wasn't uncommon to see. And you can kind of start seeing the issue here that when it comes to gender and race diversity, it's fairly lacking in this. And so you can imagine when you're looking for somebody looking for what CEOs look like, this is what the picture comes to mind because this is what our search engines are telling us. And we trust our search engines to the point where we trust them to finish our thought, right? You start typing something and before you know, search engines are finishing your sentence. So here's an example, actually, it's a very um, popular book, Algorithms of Oppression. When you start typing things like white, black women, so, and, and you start getting this uh, auto-completion, most of which are negative. And I'm sure you can do this kind of experiments with many other things. So this is sort of, um, the search engine kind of feeding into this bias in a way that it thinks that these are the right things to finish your sentence with. But we see this in many other places too. You go to some recommender system, you know, like your Amazon or YouTube. Um, and what we see is a different kind of bias. So we saw sort of the gender and um, ethnicity bias, but here's an example where on YouTube, if you're looking for NASA related things, in the top 100 things that come up or gets recommended, you can see the kind of things that gets recommended or um, 
uh, promote it a lot more, right? So all of these are videos that are kind of conspiracy theory. They are videos of some um, alien spotting, UFO spotting. And these things, you know, the first video gets recommended 11 times uh, more than the average video, right? Uh, and so you can see that there is something going on in, in YouTube's algorithm that determines that these videos, even though these are all fake news, that they should be recommended more. And why is that the case? Well, because we like seeing these kind of things. We click on them. Right? So when you talk about bias coming into our systems, it's not as simple as, oh, there is just not enough uh, of female CEOs or not enough um, non-white CEOs in the data, and that's why we're not showing it. There's actually something more happening at the surface level where the algorithms are tuned for this different kind of optimization, trying to figure out what will generate more traffic, more engagement. And yes, uh, conspiracy theorists do generate good traffic. Um, why is this a problem? So here's a typical um, a scenario for search engine. What happens, what you see here are on the x-axis are the ranks in a search result page, and the y-axis is your click-through rate, so how often people click on it. Not surprisingly, people click a lot on rank one, and then rank two, it kind of drops off, and by the time you get to rank 10, the bottom of the page, it's barely 1%, and most people are not even going to the second page. Right? So this is what we are, this is how we are engaging with these search systems. And the search systems are designed in a way to interpret this as, as a feedback signal. So it thinks that, yes, what you clicked on, um, it must be good. So let's keep promoting the same thing because people are more likely to click on it. Of course, um, the idea is the thing at the top one, the top rank is the most relevant, but that's not always the case. As I pointed out, we often click on things because it's entertaining. It's, uh, uh, it confirms our, um, our existing beliefs. It has that conspiracy theory. So this thing feeds back into the system. And so we kind of keep going through this, uh, this vicious cycle where uh, the way the algorithms are designed, they're going to optimize our, our activities and the way we do activities, we are going with what the algorithm proposes in terms of what the top things are. And that has consequences. So we saw this in the 2016 elections. Before that, um, if you look at the top 20 news stories uh, related to elections um, and their engagement on Facebook, and, and these were manually coded, what are those top 20? And, and if there are actual news or fake news, that you see that as the election approach, the, the engagement with the mainstream news start dropping and the engagement of the fake news picked up, right? So this is kind of the consequence of the way we work and the way the algorithms work. And we are very much integrated. More recently, we've seen similar things playing out uh, in our engagement with fake news uh, related to coronavirus. So there are lots of fl stories floating around that carry misinformation. And because again, the way we interpret the search results, which is, if it is at the top, it must be good. If it is recommended, it must be right. Uh, and the, the way the search engines and the systems are optimized, which is the more engagement, more activity means good. So let's keep doing that. So this is the circle. So the issue of bias is bigger than just some um, one system or one data set. Um, and it, it starts creating, connecting us in a way that we can easily separate and say, yes, this is where we're going to fix it. Um, in fact, there's a bigger picture. So um, what we did um, to, to kind of get to this, because you know you see the data bias and the, the algorithm guys, um, where do you break this circle? So what we did to, to get to this is we said, let's, let's um, take a specific example and see what we can do to break this circle. So we took this example of, um, it's called deadly spider story. So somewhere a couple of years ago, um, this post appeared on Facebook that claimed that there is a new kind of a spider discovered in um, Virginia uh, that one bite and, and it's completely deadly. And so stay away from these kind of spiders and stuff like that. 
a lot of people without thinking twice, without actually looking into that, started sharing it. And a lot of people started searching for it. So around that time, if you look at the Google search trend for deadly spider, it, it, it had a huge spike. You can see there's like almost no activity about it before, but then suddenly there's a lot of, a lot of people searching for deadly spiders. And what they are encountering are a lot of those um, fake posts and the sharing of those, uh, those posts. So this, is a, this creates a circle of that people clicking on things, believing it, and Google thinking that this is the right thing to show, so it keeps showing. So we looked at what was going on. If, if you search for deadly spiders around that time, and you look at the top 100 results, this is the kind of distribution you see, that most of the things, you see the uh, big um, oval, that was about this sharing and discussion of the original post about the deadly spider, which was, which was you know, false. But that was the big, big component. There are a few stories, and this is in the top 100. There are a few that were about fact checking on this. There are a few about uh, just the general education stories about dangerous spiders. Um, a few, very few about the first aid on spider bite. And the gray, the shaded area that you see are what you find in the top 10, right? So this whole uh, thing here is top 100 but the shaded uh, region is what you see in the top 10. So in other words, if you went to Google, search for things related to deadly spider, and if you just stayed on the first page, you pretty much just saw the, the fake news and the sharing of that fake news. Uh, and as I saw uh, discussed, most people don't go to the second page or the third page. So they would not have encountered those other stories that debunk um, those uh, fake news stories. So we said, okay, well, this, this may be a way to maybe make a difference. If only we can't stop from all this uh, fake news coming in, right? Um, but can we shift the focus so that people encounter not just those fake stories, but also maybe some of those fact-checking stories? And then enough people notice them and enough people click on it, maybe the search engine will start learning that those are the right things to display. Um, so how do we do that? So Here's what we did. Uh, we said we need to bring more diversity into our search result presentation. It's not enough to just go with the, the most relevant because the most relevant concept has been muddied up through the way the search engines work. So here's what we did. We took um, these top 100 results. Um, those 100 results, we created two clusters so that we get some mix of two different topics. And then we created new algorithms to re-rank the search results to have a more fair ranking. And I'll go into that. We consider two kinds of fairness here. Fairness, by the way, is a very complex concept. It's a social concept. And I won't go into too much detail about what fairness should be, could be. But we looked at a more statistical measure of fairness. One is statistical parity, which says that um, each group should have equal representation. The other is disparate impact, which says that the bigger group should have more representation. Every group should have representation uh, and it should be in proportion to the size of that group. So we consider, and I'm not taking a stand on which one is right or better, but these are two ways to do it. So uh, this work was done with my former student, Royan Gao, who's now at Amazon. And we had uh, a few papers uh, with this work. So let's get to it. So what, what did we do? We took some data from Google um, 100 queries. For each query, we looked at the top 100 results. Um, we did the same with uh, New York Times data. Um, we collected nearly 2 million articles published by New York Times. Uh, we had a set of 50 queries. For each queries, again, we looked at the, the top 100 results. And then, as I said, we did the clustering. So those 100 results for each query, we created two clusters as a way, and those are topical clusters. So as a way to identify what are the two underlying major you know, themes in, that, in those the results. Um, here are some examples of the queries. And these are kind of timely at that time. These are the things that people are searching for. Um, right. Okay, so here's our problem. This is what we're trying to do. Um, we have 100 results. So these columns, there are 10 columns. Each column has 10. 
So this re represent our 10, um, 10 result pages, each having 10 results. Um, and so total 100 results. And from those 100 results, we're trying to create just the top 10. So how do we do this? Um, on top of that, we know we've done the clustering. So we know that there are results belonging to two different topics, the red topics and the blue topics. Yeah. Okay, so if you are doing, um, sorry, my slides are skipping without, um, if you're doing statistical parity, then essentially it says, well, both blue and red should have equal representation. So in our top 10, we should have five blue and five red. Okay. If you're doing disparate impact, it says that they should have equal representation, I mean, um, representation corresponding to their size. So we know that in the top 100, there are 70 blue and 30 red, which means in top 10, there should be seven blue and three red. So that's easy to solve in a way. Um, but the problem is we are, this is not a classification problem. This is a ranking problem. So we can't just stack all the blue up and then red because the ranking matters, the presentation matters. As we saw, people tend to click more on the top results and not so much in the bottom results. So we need to do something different. Um, so here's what we did. Um, we do the statistical parity, which means we need to get five blue and five red, but rather than just dumping five blue and five red, we go according to the order in which they appear in the original rank list. So we dig out the top five blue. Uh, oops. In the order they appear. And we dig out the top five red in the order they appear. And we put them in that order in those top 10. So now you still have five blue and five red, but, but they're kind of keeping their relative order, right? So this is kind of getting some amount of fairness by the definition of statistical parity. Similarly, if you have disparate impact, which means you're looking for seven blue and three red, you pick the seven blue, the top seven blue in the way they appear, and then the top three red in the, the way they appear, and then you preserve that relative ranking and come up with the, the top 10. So now you're bringing that up fairness um, and diversity um, in, in a way. But what we're doing, we're still kind of digging through mostly the first page, maybe going a little bit on the second page. You know, that's, that's still not completely addressing this problem. We, we really need to explore more. So an, another variation of this is what we call the page-wise uh, statistical parity. So here, instead of just sampling from the top, the first page, we go across, right? So before we were sampling um, vertically, now we are sampling horizontally. And we pick the five blue across those pages. And we pick the five red across the pages. And we put them in the relative order of that. So now you start seeing a little bit more mixing of red and blue. Right? Um, similarly, disparate impact, we're looking for seven blue and three red. We sample accordingly. We get to, to the top 10. Still, we're not exploring enough. We're only looking, so it's sort of like we have a choice of either going um, column-wise or row-wise. Can we do both? So that's why we came up with a, a new algorithm based on epsilon greedy. So what you do here is epsilon is a very small number. It's between zero and one, but it's typically small, like 0.1. So with that probability, you explore. So that's your kind of amount of freedom you have to go and find things from anywhere. And with one minus epsilon, so it's not gonna be pretty high, you go and do what you normally would do, okay? So if epsilon is set to zero, that means you just default to what Google will give you. Full exploitation, no exploration. If epsilon was one, you go and do full exploration. So it's almost like a randomness. So we don't want to do either. We don't want to just result to being Google. We also don't want to just do complete random. So here's one version. Um, it's called naive epsilon greedy. So where with that small probability, we do the random selection from the entire top list, you know, the 100. And with one minus epsilon, we pick the what Google gives us. So in other words, if epsilon was set to 0.1, 
roughly one out of 10 of those top 10 would come from anywhere in the, the 100 you know, list. Right? If you set it to 0.2, then it will be two and so on. But we can do slightly better than that. And so that's what we call you know, epsilon greedy that's based on a notion of fairness. So what we do here is rather than just going anywhere, when epsilon uh, uh, probability is set, you randomly pick a cluster, not a document from the 100. You pick a cluster, and then you pick the top thing from that cluster. And when you're doing exploitation, you go and find whichever is the fair cluster and just keep picking from that. And what is a fair cluster? Again, that can be defined based on what we're trying to achieve here. Are we trying to achieve statistical parity or disparate impact? Right. So what this does, it combines two things into one. It combines our notion of, well, we need to bring diversity, but we also need to be careful about what level of fairness we're trying to achieve here. Is it the statistical parity or disparate impact, right? So it kind of encourages exploration, but, but, but not just some randomness, but it actually tries to conform to some level of uh, fairness. So what did we find? Um, we found that we could actually improve the fairness um, without sacrificing um, relevance. And this was very important because sure, you can bring in more diversity but, or, or, and increase fairness, but is that really, people are, are people really going to like this? Um, well, we found that uh, we can measure relevance uh, um, and, and, and show that it actually maintains or even sometimes even improves with increasing fairness. We can just bring better results by doing random exploration. So diversity is important, but you can just do randomness and call it diversity. Um, and here's what we found finally, back to that original result or original uh, example. On the left side is the original thing where the shaded region shows that what shows up in top 10. When we apply our epsilon greedy algorithm, you can see the shaded region now spanned out across multiple things. It still has a lot of things that are fake news, but it now starts bringing things that are more on the fact checking and, and mainstream news on those things. So the hope is as, we, as more people see some of those things mixing in with their top 10, maybe they're gonna start clicking on some of those and that will feed back into the algorithms to say, yeah, maybe those are the right thing to show. So this is how we start to break that vicious circle. Right? Now, this is all better, you know, like e easier said than done. So this is all done kind of without actually having the users. So we also ask, well, can we look at the real impact on real users? Can people uh, with this kind of diversity uh, included, with this kind of fairness included, can they tell the difference between the, their original result, Google result and, and what we are providing. So we designed this game called Google or not. What you do in that is you go and play this game where there is a query and then you get two sets of results. And the game is you identify which one is from Google and which is not, right? So this was our way to see if people can tell the difference uh, when we introduce that diversity, can they tell the difference that it's not good results? Well, we found that most people can't. Oops, it skipped a lot of slides. So we found that most people can tell the difference between the original Google results and uh, those with designed with our Epsilon 0.3, right? So in other words, we were able to bring in about 30% of diversity, increase the fairness, increase the exposure to uh, more information sources, and people not finding any difference in their satisfaction, in their relevance, right? Um, but of course we can't push it too far. So, um, but the important thing here is we're able to start kind of breaking that vicious circle um, and, and hope that, you know, this kind of feeds back into those algorithms, right? So we need to do the work from both sides, the fixing some of the algorithm, but also fixing the way we um, get exposed to that information. So I'm gonna leave you with that thought and turn it over to Tanu who will tell us more about where we can take this work on algorithmic bias and um, uh, connect it with the governance.
Awesome. Thanks, uh, Chirag. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for attending uh, in this virtual session. Um, and so speaking of bias and then kind of uh, uh, going around on that same thread of uh, bias that um, uh, Chirag was mentioning, uh, this work stemmed out of this realization that uh, information retrieval systems, specifically search and recommendations uh, platforms and algorithms, are often built to optimize for relevance. Uh, and not really with the notion of whether the information that it's returning, whether it's accurate uh, or not. Uh, so in this uh, screenshot here on the left side, uh, what you see is if you search for chemtrails conspiracy on uh, YouTube or say 9-11 is a hoax or earth is flat, you would indeed get results uh, supporting these false narratives. And for e-commerce platforms, this is even more alarming because people are making money off of selling products. So the screenshot on the right uh, shows you how when you search for a vaccine on Amazon, uh, it often would return anti-vaccine uh, books as one of the top uh, search results. And, and this is true even, uh, it was true at least when we did the, uh, the study. All right, uh, the slides got stuck. All right, so that brings us to this next part of this talk about algorithmic governance. So now that we know that the, uh, these AI systems have bias, uh, what can we do about it? How do we ensure our governance mechanism for uh, the platforms and the algorithms driving these platforms, right? So audit is one way that we can start on these uh, governance uh, route. And here I would briefly mention about two studies where we have done these uh, audits on two uh, platforms. And in both these audits, our goal was to investigate the search and recommendation algorithms of uh, these two platforms, YouTube and Amazon. Um, and both these sets of work has been peer reviewed and published at um, uh, tier one conferences. In fact, the second work, the Amazon work also received a, a best paper honorable mention. So a major motivation for this YouTube study comes from these frequent headlines that I was noticing a few years ago. Uh, things like how YouTube drives people to the internet's darkest corner, how Google is directing uh, people to extreme content and conspiracy theories, or this New York Times opinion piece, uh, which says that YouTube is, the, is this great uh, radicalizer. So the simple question here is, how bad is this? That is, is there any hard empirical evidence either to prove or disprove any of these anecdotal stories, any of these opinion pieces that were uh, coming out in, in popular press? And this is what our study aimed to do, that is verify these anecdotal claims. Does YouTube really surface these problematic content or not? And in order to do this, we conducted systematic audits on YouTube's search and recommendation algorithms. And we picked on one type of problematic content that is conspiracy theories. So now I've talked about audit a couple of times so far, but what really is an audit? And then how do you really audit an algorithm? So I'm gonna give you a quick definition through an example uh, to just uh, illustrate this, uh, this point. So one of the earliest examples of audits, and in fact, one of my favorite one comes from this 2004 paper uh, where uh, the researchers conducted a field experiment to investigate employment discrimination. That is, they audited the labor market for racial discrimination. So they set up this very clever experiment where they responded with fictitious resumes to help wanted ads in Boston and Chicago uh, newspapers. And in order to manipulate the perception of race, uh, each of the resumes were assigned either a very African-American uh, sounding name such as Lakeisha or Jamal, or they picked a very white sounding name such as Emily or Greg. And these were all fictitious resumes and they send these out and they, then they waited to hear for callbacks for interviews. And what they found was there was significant discrimination against African-American names uh, and um, because white sounding names receive 50% more callbacks for interviews for, for these entire set of fictitious resumes. So this is the core idea behind audit. That is you manipulate or change one variable. In this case, the researchers change the race variable and you then determine how the algorithm or how the system will react to that uh, change, that manipulation. So translating this uh, into the context of YouTube, uh, we'll be using this concept of manipulating a variable to determine whether the search and recommendation algorithm return different results when say someone's age or someone's gender or someone's watch history is different. 
That is, how does demographic variation, age, gender, geolocation, where a person is searching or using the platform uh, from, or their watch history, how does that affect how much problematic information, how much misinformation will be returned by a search and recommendation algorithm, in particular in case of YouTube? So in order to answer these questions, uh, we set up this really elaborate audit framework, which, which broadly looked like this. So uh, this is a very simple way of representing it, but uh, the, the machinery behind is much more sophisticated. Um, and so in a sense, what we did was we had programmed these uh, Selenium uh, bots, which behaved like normal users who were logging into YouTube. And they were, then they were running these queries on the search platform. Uh, and we also had a script at the back end, which uh, collected whatever search results or whatever recommendation uh, results the YouTube platform was returning. So uh, we audited for three uh, primary components of YouTube, the search results that it was returning, the up next uh, recommendation uh, video, and then the top five recommended videos. So in other words, uh, the left side shows how YouTube search algorithm um, uh, was audited and the right uh, shows uh, the audit auditing of the recommendation algorithm. Uh, so the key question was, uh, does demographic age and gender and geolocation have an effect? And for demographics, uh, we checked for four different age groups, two types of gender. Uh, and in order to do that, we created accounts with, uh, uh, with these different properties. So for choose two, that amounts to eight different combinations. So we had eight different accounts uh, firing these uh, search queries on uh, YouTube's platform. And for geolocation, we found the hot and cold regions, that is regions which have the highest or the lowest interest for that particular topic. Um, and so we found these uh, regions using Google's interest over time graph. Um, so for example, um, uh, what you see here in the screen, uh, flat earth theories um, was a really uh, highly searched topic in the Montana region. So all the, all the things in, the, in, in red in this map shows are the hot regions for, uh, for this uh, topic search whereas the blue regions are the cold regions, so less interest in this topic. Uh, so New Jersey is one of the cold regions for this um, topic search. So once we had all these parameters defined, we created bots uh, who would keep firing queries on YouTube. And for geolocation, um, these bots would be firing queries from IP addresses of, of these locations that you see in this slide. So what did we find? Um, so we found that for brand new accounts, that is accounts we ha which have not yet built any watch history, the demographic and geolocation did not really have any effect on the way the platform was returning uh, content. So that is a really encouraging result for the platform, which means that there was no misinformation bias for these brand new accounts. However, that's not the full story. Once these accounts started building a history, uh, both de demographic and geolocation did exert an effect on the recommendations for uh, certain combinations of topic, for certain stances of these content, um, and then certain components of, of YouTube, right? So there was an effect that watch history had. So I'm gonna just highlight a couple of results uh, here. Uh, so for example, for the 9-11 topic searches, uh, if you uh, watch videos which are promoting 9-11 conspiracies, uh, the platform was returning more of these promoting videos in the recommendations. And we were empirically able to prove this through our audit experiment. However, surprisingly for the vaccine topic, the effect was completely opposite for the recommendation algorithms. So if um, as a bot or in this case, uh, user uh, would watch anti-vaccine videos, YouTube recommends debunking videos, both in the up next, as well as in the top five components, which implies that YouTube has fixed or has changed its recommendations for the vaccine topic, but not really for the 9-11 topic, or for that matter, the other types of problematic topic that we uh, investigated. So things like chemtrails, flat earth, for all of these, um, uh, we did find that watching uh, more of those uh, uh, pro-conspiracy videos did return um, you know, promoting pro-conspiracy videos. So this tells us that YouTube is handling misinformation to some extent, but it is handling in a much more reactive way. That is, it is modifying the search and recommendation algorithms selectively based on uh, the kind of reactions it is getting from media and technology critics. So if there is a lot of um, uh, criticism around vaccine misinformation, uh, of course, the next step is to go and fix the algorithm uh, for that. But there is, people are not complaining about 9-11 conspiracies, so there is not much incentive to fix that on the platform. Uh, so in conclusion, despite YouTube saying that it has reduced conspiracies on its platform, it still has a long way to go. Um, so now moving on to a different platform, Amazon. 
so for Amazon, the leading e-retailer platform, our focus here was on vaccine misinformation. And again, this was uh, largely motivated by several media reports suggesting that Amazon's algorithms um, are putting health and vaccine misinformation at the top of, our, of your reading list. Uh, and I should note that when we started the study, this was pre-COVID uh, era, uh, so before vaccines was a popular discussed topic. So, uh, so trust me, we didn't time the study uh, to, to happen uh, strategically around the time when vaccines were released. However, the results of our study came out um, uh, during uh, uh, the, the COVID time when vaccination was in everybody's uh, mind. So when we uh, saw these uh, uh, reports um, uh, a year or so ago, um, the question again was, how bad is this? And so uh, to answer, we conducted these systematic audits on Amazon search and recommendation algorithms. And here also we picked one type of problematic content, which is vaccine misinformation. And we had a very similar setup as before, as our YouTube study, uh, we controlled for no noise to ensure that uh, the effect that we are indeed observing uh, from our audit experiments is from the algorithm is, and it's not because of uh, some um, unnoticed noise uh, that the system has introduced. And this whole audit setup was a, was a huge engineering feat. And in some sense, it was a little more sophisticated than the YouTube uh, experiment um, because um, Amazon has way more layers of recommendations um, moreover, we also audited for a variety of user actions, uh, things like what happens when the user searches for certain content or what happens when the user searches and clicks on a, a, a pro-anti-vaccine information or a debunking anti-vaccine misinformation, or what happens when the user searches, clicks, and adds the product to the cart um, that is shows an intention to buy that product. So what did we find? Uh, again, highlighting uh, one quick result here. Um, so let's say users start with searching for vaccine. They click on, on an anti-vaccine book. So the example that you see on the screen, this is actually a real result. It, it's, it's, a, it's a book that is available, at least that was available when we did uh, the study um, a year ago. Now next, uh, as, as soon as a user clicks, uh, the algorithm serves the user with three other anti-vaccine books in the product recommendation uh, uh, page. Now, once a user adds uh, the book to the cart, that is, uh, they show their intention to buy uh, the, both the pre-purchase recommendation as well as a homepage recommendation, all of that changes with many more uh, anti-vax uh, uh, books. So this tells us that uh, once a user starts engaging with these misinformative products, they will be presented or they are being presented with more of these misinformative stuff at almost every uh, point of their navigation route. So in other words, we found this sort of a filter bubble uh, uh, effect. And I should note that this was not just a one-off uh, case study. Um, if we zoom out and look at this entire recommendation graph um, uh, from our uh, audit experiment, we found a filter bubble effect more pronounced uh, for misinformative products. Uh, so here, the red nodes that you see are the, are the nodes which were uh, products which are annotated as misinformative. And although you see two different uh, sets of components here, this is actually one graph and the two components are not really connected, which just tells you that people who are in this red zone, who have been viewing misinformative products, they remain in this red zone and in this filter bubble of uh, mostly being recommended anti-vaccine uh, products which is a concern. Um, so this work actually received uh, uh, a lot of uh, press attention, both uh, locally, nationally, as well as internationally. Uh, we also got Amazon spokesperson to respond. Um, although I should say it was, uh, the, the response was nothing uh, concrete. And I say that because Amazon spokesperson responded to these media reports uh, by talking about uh, the recently introduced banner uh, with a link to these uh, federal government's uh, facts about COVID-19. Uh, however, as of this morning, when, when I search for vaccine on the platform, um, you, you find this sort of a page where uh, essentially three out of the four of these products, the top products, the best sellers, the two best sellers and the Amazon chart product, all three of these products are uh, promoting some form of vaccine or health misinformation. Um, so the key question is, uh, now that we know that these, uh, these platforms have these problems, these harms, what can we do about it? How do we set the path towards a meaningful algorithmic governance and what are the challenges in, in doing so? So here are a few ideas uh, that explores some of the possibilities for setting towards this path for algorithmic governance. 
The first is about governance via um, audits. And, and so the, here there could be many layers to this. Um, uh, one of this is the external audits. This is what we did and what I showed you in the last few minutes. And here the goal is to identify risks uh, that the platform or the algorithm has, and we'll do that from outside the system. And these risks can be anything from misinformation to bias, um, accessibility issues, fairness issues, representation, accountability, uh, discrimination issues, etc. And then scholars have conducted these audits to identify such risks on a variety of platforms, uh, Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, Apple News, etc. Um, so we as researchers are doing these audits. The question is, is it really making a difference, right? We still don't have a system in place where say the algorithms or companies running these algorithms are truly accountable to an independent uh, third party. And this reminds me uh, in some way how consumer reports operate. So these consumer reports is an independent nonprofit member organization that works side by side with consumers for truth, transparency and fairness in the marketplace. And they go into great lengths for testing cars, washing machine, your essentially your everyday products that you use. So the question is why can't we do the same for algorithms when uh, in most cases you're using these search and recommendation algorithms way more frequently, may, way more uh, uh, frequently than say you're using your washing machine. Um, the other shortcoming with external audit is that they are a form of a reactive governance. They operate after the algorithm has been deployed and so after the harm has been done. Uh, and so plus as external auditors uh, who are poking at these systems only from the outside, we really do not have access to these model outputs. We do not uh, have access to these um, intermediate models or training data, right? So which are often protected as trade secrets. So as an alternative, uh, another option is to do internal audits. Um, and so researchers at Google have made this case uh, where they presented this internal audit framework, which makes audits a core part of this product development before the product is deployed, when it is deployed, as well as after it is deployed. Um, my next proposition is uh, about value-centered audits. So this is an active conversation around um, emphasizing social values while designing uh, algorithms. And I think we also need to turn that thinking into how we can value and respect the humans involved in these, in these audits. And so questions can be, how can we balance uh, uh, the values of our key stakeholders, users, their data, uh, auditors, and the fair treatment of uh, auditors? And in fact, to delve into this question um, uh, of fair treatment of auditors, fact checkers in our case, um, I have launched uh, this research endeavor with a fact checking organization based in uh, Kenya. And one of the big motivation for this project was also uh, this question of, are we really taking into consideration diverse voices in this governance structure? Or are we really focused on these, uh, on only US centric and Eurocentric voices, right? So are we doing culturally responsible AI? Finally, how do we ensure actionable audits, that is audits that result in, in, in real change? Uh, and so here we have started to build coalitions with industry partners, uh, specifically Mozilla Foundation, to do some of this audit work at a larger scale. And most importantly, to see the possibility of going beyond just these uh, bot accounts uh, set up of audits, uh, but rather um, uh, have the possibility of uh, including real people in these in our audit setup. So let's say uh, uh, having a browser extension a fire, or sitting on your Firefox browser where uh, you know, people will be willing to donate their uh, data for uh, audit work for science. And so um, to ending this uh, talk here, you might be wondering why does all these matters, right? So why should companies really care about this? So this is an official uh, uh, Federal Trade Commission FTC blog post uh, that came out uh, a couple of weeks ago, which notice, uh, notes that the FTC Act prohibits fair and unfair deceptive uh, practices. And that would include sale or use of, for example, racially biased algorithms. Uh, so this just tells that regulations are coming and it is in, in the interest of uh, organizations uh, to actually work with uh, their users, uh, collaborators, interested third parties, academics, to think about how they can uh, chart this way forward and the path forward for algorithmic uh, governance and control these sorts of uh, harmful uh, behaviors. Uh, so that's it from my side, and uh, uh, Chirag is going to close for this uh, last slide uh, to talk about uh, what we are doing next in this space. Yeah, thank you, Thanu. So hopefully everybody has had some appreciation for this topic. As you can see, that there is there's a lot of big problems, and it's not just that they are tough problems, but they're very complex, integrated problems. These are not just system problems. 
these are not just society problem. Uh, there's a fair bit of you know education, uh, there's a fair bit of governance, policy, all of these. So what we're doing at uh, University of Washington, you know, stemming from iSchool, um, is trying to tackle these problems collectively. So today you heard from Tanu and uh, myself, but we have several other faculty um, at iSchool and at UW at large, and we are all gathered under this umbrella called Responsible AI Systems and Experiences, or RAISE, um, within which we are looking at um, not just what AI systems could do, but also what they should do. Now, how do we build these systems? So we are still interested in building, um, we're not anti-AI, we are actually interested in building this uh, smart systems, but how do we do this responsibly? Um, and so we're looking at issues of uh, bias and fairness, some of that you heard today, as well as accountability and transparency. Um, and we're trying to become, build more inclusive human-centric AI systems. So um, we hope that this becomes a way for many of you to connect with us, not just with Tanu and me, but at large at UW under this, uh, this uh, banner of race. So uh, with that, I wanna thank everybody for attending. Thank you so much. And I guess we'll open up for questions. I think uh, there was uh, maybe a couple of questions that were sent earlier. Uh, so I can uh, start with the first one and then maybe Chirag, you can take the next. Uh, so I think one of the things that uh, came up was how do we keep ourselves updated on the algorithmic bias and act on it? And sort of there was a second question, which I thought could go with the first one is uh, what can we do to combat this kind of uh, bias? Uh, so I think the fact that you are aware that these bias exist, that these algorithms are not like really magic or these systems are uh, do not uh, have problems uh, and you, the realization is, is really important. And so that's the for good first step. I think the next thing um, is uh, while I mentioned a lot about audits and how researchers, we did that, I think as individuals, as users, um, uh, each of you have a lot of power in also uh, doing these sorts of audits yourself, right? So there's this, um, in the scholarly world, uh, there is this another uh, idea that's floating around everyday algorithmic auditing. Um, and, and essentially in which uh, as users, you could detect, understand, and inter interrogate these sort of problematic machine behavior uh, through your day-to-day -day interactions with these systems. And, and this might seem like a utopian idea, but actually I'll give you one quick example uh, just to see, uh, just to show you that how this is possible. Uh, so uh, uh, I think it was last year when Twitter's image cropping algorithm was exhibiting racial discrimination by focusing on white faces and cropping out uh, black ones. And so uh, Twitter users began to notice this uh, and they, they kind of came together organically to investigate this problem. They shared uh, you know, the diff different instances. And so they ought to sort of coll uh, collaboratively and collectively this, uh, did this sort of uh, audit themselves and found the problem. And so when Twitter's uh, company, as a company, they said it had tested the service for bias before it started using it, um, uh, the users of the system actually uh, responded and reacted back by saying that, hey, we have tested this, this doesn't work. Uh, so just to uh, let you know that you do have the power to kind of do and investigate these systems, irrespective of whether you know the ins and outs of these uh, algorithms. Yeah, and I'll add a little bit to that, that um, in terms of combating this bias, um, there are things that needs to happen from both sides. There are things that needs to happen from the system side, but we have almost equal responsibility as the users of these systems. Um, every time we click on something, we're voting for it. Every time we share something, we are voting for it. And so just like any other, uh, any election, we kind of want to be careful about how we vote. Um, we found that people are not as careful, not nearly as careful when they're just clicking, right? You're just kind of thinking, oh, it's just a funny video. I want to just watch it. Or it's just like, oh, I, that, that seems, you know, interesting, you know, that conspiracy theory. So what if I click on it? Big deal. But enough of us do this enough time and that kind of feeds back into it. Um, so one thing, you know, um, talking about Twitter that they start doing, which now Facebook is also starting to do is when you are sharing a new story, when you're sharing a link without actually reading that, it would give you this little warning. Are you sure you want to do this? 
right? And, and it's been shown that that just, that little awareness often slows people down or makes them think, you know what, you're right. Before I just blindly share this based on just the catchy headline, I should probably look into this, or at least I can open it up and then I can decide if I really want to share. So I think we all have a part to play in, in how these things play out. So yeah, I think that's, uh, uh, that's how we're going to win this war. I mean, it's it's not going to be easy. Let me move on to the next question, and I'll start, and <clears throat> maybe Tanu can tag on. Um, how would you go about bringing these topics in a workplace if they haven't already been considered? It's essentially, how do you start the conversation of ethics and AI? So I, I do a fair bit of work with industry, so I can, based on my experience, I can say I've seen three reasons people uh, pay attention to this. Not all of them are good reasons. Um, one is, well, because everybody's talking about it. What is this ethics in AI? We should also do it. <clears throat> so because other people are doing and they start talking about it, even though they have absolutely no clue. Uh, but, you know, that's that's a start, maybe. The second reason is um, they're working with customers and clients um, and maybe in the regular, regulatory agencies that require them or expect this from them. Uh, so just to be compliant, just to kind of um, meet some standards, they, they, they want to kind of look at this. So GDPR, for instance, is one example where this got implemented in, in Europe and now all the companies have to comply with it. So now they had to kind of dig into their data and practices to see how they can you know, be compliant. The third reason I've seen, which is perhaps the strongest and the most uh, sort of the stickiest one, is when you associate things like pra practices on fairness and transparency with your bottom line, where you see that this is not just the right thing to do, but it's actually good, um, you know, in, 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 according to some business metrics. Um, so when I work with Spotify, um, you know, there are a lot of us who kind of believed in being fairness, um, but what really caught the senior leadership's attention is when we showed that being fair in a marketplace and Spotify is a marketplace. You have the artists on one side and you have listeners on the other side, Amazon, eBay, Facebook, all of these are marketplaces. They have multiple sites that in a marketplace being fair could actually create more sustainable ecosystem for everybody. Um, it can create a longer lasting value for customers and, and not just looking at the, the more immediate kind of optimization uh, around revenue. So, so that kind of, that was the most powerful thing to, to associate things, issues on fairness and, and um, uh, ethics and uh, transparency to what would be actually good for business. Right? So, so there are these different ways to bring up these conversations or, or encourage at least some discussion within your organization. These are some of you know, my, my experiences. Yeah, and I think just to add on to those, uh, what, what has been said is uh, uh, like putting responsible AI into practice is, is a difficult uh, conversation. And I think uh, when, uh, when I talk to companies, even, you know, they, they express the, the problems with, the, uh, with putting it into practice. So one of the things that, uh, that has happened uh, with, I guess, this awareness is uh, there's a lot more internal processes that are in, at play where internally in a, in a sort of a grassroots action within the organization, uh, the employees um, are, are pushing for um, uh, the, these uh, responsible AI uh, initiatives. And I guess that's a pretext behind this question as well. Um, and I hope uh, through through those uh, uh, internal um, uh, communication that that pressure uh, we can resolve and and put the, and, and start these conversations around ethics and AI in a much more um, uh, productive way. Um, I think there's a question in the live chat, and this might be for Chirag, uh, you, and uh, I don't know if you can access it. It's uh, It's about, is, is Google the only SEO that's been audited this way? Perhaps we can build a new SEO that has these epsilon greedy, fair algorithm search results built in. Um, yeah, so uh, again, you know, the, the challenges with these things, so we can do the auditing 
right? And we can find ways to, like we can find uh, these issues and we can find ways to improve on it. Um, in reality, of course, there's a lot more that goes on. So it's not like places like Google, they're not just places where you go look for information, right? Because of course there are many other search engines, there are alternatives, and yet at least 80% people are not going to those alternatives. Uh, even if I show them that, look, you know, those other places give you just as good, if not better results. So we, there, there's certain kind of branding that's gone uh, with this, this Google. Um, and so I think it takes, takes more than just fixing the technical challenges. There is a big social challenge. There is a big, um, you know, the biases happen through not just, as we saw, uh, not just through the data and algorithms, but also through uh, presentation through branding and all kinds of ways. So I think there are a lot of other ways to, um, not a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of other steps to take to actually um, address this. But the first step is still to find an alternative because why would anyone look for a different solution if there are just no alternatives? And we've seen this in many cases and um, Facebook is another case that I will point out um, where, we don't have good alternatives. Um, so creating alternatives is the first step, uh, creating different practices, alternate practices, the first thing. And then we have to work on how do we convince people to leave their brand loyalty um, to kind of start migrating. But it's, 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 it's been done in the past. It's been done with many other systems. So I know it can happen, um, but building our own web crawler or search engine, it's not as trivial as you can imagine, um, that it's more than just solving technical challenges. There's also a social challenge to, to solve. Maybe you have time for one last question, Tanu, if you want yeah, to. Yeah, I can maybe make this quick. I think there was a question uh, earlier um, asking, how does technology help in identifying a bias to a twisted facts article or a news post? Um, this is a great question, and I feel like uh, I, I'll take a different take while answering this. Um, uh, most of the time, we give technology a, a lot more uh, credence than maybe it deserves. Um, uh, so, so there's a yes and no answer to this question. So yes, you can uh, devise uh, some form of technology to identify uh, uh, some form of bias or twisted facts today. But now, let's say tomorrow, there are new falsehoods which spring up. Um, and so now your, your algorithm and your technology completely fails to catch that, right? Uh, so something, let's say your algorithm has, has learned to recognize, uh, for lack of a better example, Holocaust denial, and it can immediately spot that but now it will completely fail to spot, say, Rohingya genocide, right? So, uh, so, so I think it, it, this is a problem with when we with these algorithms operate in these uh, ever-evolving uh, uh, space of uh, news, information, misinformation, um, um, hate speech, and so on. Um, so it must be trained on these um, on, on these uh, new data, and, and, and these trainings require also human annotation. So I think as going back to the previous point, what uh, Chirag was mentioning, um, just making the technology work by itself might not be sufficient because it works in the socio-technical framework, framework where you need uh, some form of human input as well into this uh, space. And I think that's all the time we have for. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I would end with saying that, you know, uh, uh, we all have a part to play, not just as users, but also we are in a position uh, to educate others, to bring awareness. So I encourage everybody to do that. So what can you do? Um, think of using that position for bringing that awareness and that education. Um, but um, with that, uh, um, we wanna thank everybody for joining us. Thank you for the um, Alumni Association for organizing this. I'm assuming that you're all connected to the uh, iSchool and the UW Alumni Association. Uh, but please, uh, if not, then consider, you know, being connected, staying connected. As our Dean said, uh, join our next event. And uh, uh, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for all your questions and for listening to us. Bye, everyone.